bring in Lewis Riddick, uh, the uh, Monday Night Football analyst, former pro scout, director of pro personnel, and of course, a former uh, NFL defensive back who joins us on the program. Lewis, thanks for joining us. Was that a dirty hit on Patrick Mahomes, in your opinion, by Mac Wilson? No, it, it, it really didn't. It didn't come off that way to me watching it live. And, you know, having watched Mac Wilson play and, and you know, and anecdotally just kind of like seeing what other people have said about Mac Wilson and how Mac kind of expressed, you know, his feelings afterwards. No, it, it didn't seem like that. Quite honestly, Dan, when I saw the hit, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, wow, where where did it come from? I mean, how how did he get – you know, how do you get concussed on this play? Because it wasn't a vicious style hit. It wasn't like the same kind of hit like Jadevian put on uh, uh, put on Carson Wentz in the playoff game a year ago. It wasn't that same kind of you know hit to the back of the head. So I mean, I, I was I was kind of shocked, quite honestly, when when Patrick got up looking the way that he did. But um, you know, from all indications, based on what Andy said, he he was doing well after the game, and hopefully he can play next week. Well, I thought Sorensen's hit on Higgins, helmet to helmet, was far more right. egregious, and that was not called. Absolutely, I mean, no question about that. And I and I think that's something that that the league and the referees are going to have to be more consistent about and continue to work to try and be more consistent. Because look, I mean, Nick clearly dropped his head, clearly hit Higgins in the side of the head. I mean, it was, I mean, it, it's as plain as day, and. Although that's not reviewable, I mean, it's just it's it's wild that that is not that th- that's not being called with more consistency. And I understand it's a big game and it's a crucial play, and you don't want to you don't have crucial plays like that in ball games decided by ref you know referee calls and flags being put on the field. But in the name of safety, which is always what this has always been about, you have to strive for more consistency than that. What do you think of the rule where you do you fumble the ball out of the end zone and automatically you know the defense it, you turn it over to the defense? Yeah, I, I think I'm like I'm like everyone else. I mean, you, you don't. It, it seems very ridiculous that you know in the, in the, that you're being punished for effort for trying to score the football, and you know, and then you lose possession of the football totally at that point in time, and you know you don't have another chance to try and punch it in. I mean. I, with the rule being what it is, I mean, you've heard many coaches, you know, Bill Belichick in particular, and I, and I, and I know Kevin Stefanski he was talking about it as well, coach players to not reach the ball out unless you are sure, unless you know you're able to score, don't do it, which you're never going to know if you're able, that, you know, to score per se. And, and, it, and it sucks because it's one of those plays that really kind of took the wind out of, uh, out of the sails of the Browns at that point in time. But it's something I'm sure they're going to look at here in the off season because you just don't you don't want those kind of things again coming up in big games, Dan, deciding football games or deciding the momentum or you know significantly uh, swinging the momentum of football games. But how would you fix the rule? I think you know at the that, that's hard to say. I mean, I think there's a there's a number of different ways that you could. I think at that point in time, you know, I I don't I don't really know. I don't really know. Because I, I said, really just take it back it. to the 25-yard line, loss of down, and yeah. and then that way I, I'm going to punish you, but I'm not going to punish you for that extra effort. I, I, it, I can't decimate you for something like that. Although I do agree with what Belichick and Mike Vrabel say to their players, just don't do it. Be, right. But I'm thinking if we change the rule, how do we change the rule? Yeah. And, and maybe you just bring it back to the 25-yard line. Yeah, I mean that that's that sounds like a you know a pretty standard way to try and legislate that kind of play you know as, as far as legislating some kind of action or some kind of punishment. It's it's hard. I, you know, I haven't really thought it through about how exactly would you fix it. Although it, it just seems way too punitive, obviously, to take the ball away from the offense again in punishing effort like that. I'd have to give more thought to exactly what you know, how to do that. And I think the league's going to have to, too. And I think that's why the rule hasn't been changed because they probably haven't been able to think about, well, exactly what do you change it to then? What, what makes the most sense in that kind of situation? Uh, as a former defensive back, I want you to put yourself in the defense yesterday with the Browns when you see Chad Henney and it's fourth mm-hmm. down and you see the play clock. They're going to try to draw you off sides. You don't think that... Chad Henney is going to run a play given where the ball is and what's at stake here. What do you think as a defensive player in, in a situation like that and the possibility of them running a play? 
Yeah, as a second level defender in particular, Dan, and you're not on the on the defensive line. Obviously, if you're if you're D lineman, I think first and foremost you're thinking number one. I'm just not jumping off sides. I'm not moving till this ball moves, even if I'm late off the football. So I think their mindset is much different than the second and third level defenders. If you're a linebacker or safety, you're off the ball anyway, so you don't really care about hard count. You're not. It's not going to really affect you one way or another. What you need to be focused in on is, in the event that they do run a play. I need to know where I need to be. And I know is particularly where I need to be in regards to who their best players are. So I definitely needed to know where number 10 was. Yeah. I needed to know where Tyreek was going to be. And you can't relax in that type of situation. And then lastly, with fourth and one type situations, you're sitting there in the shotgun. I mean, that's where from a coaching standpoint, you just have to like, like sprint right option is something that Andy Reid and all West Coast offenses have run over and over again. That's and that's all that play was. It's, that's what they were running back in the days of Bill Walsh. And, and I mean, it seems it sounds easier, you know, easier said than done at this point in time. But I think that, that that's what it's all. That's what it's about on the professional level. It's about preparation. It's about key moments like that. And you just have to be prepared for it. You can't get caught off guard. You, you just can't. And I know everyone from 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 Romo to the people sitting at home were shocked that they actually ran the play. But, again, if you're a second- or third-level defender, you're a linebacker, safety, corner, it's about doing your job and not worrying about whether or not they're just going to try and draw the you know the front four or front five offside. And, that, and it's, it's just too bad. It's too bad that if, in fact, people did relax and weren't really – playing with the same kind of uh, urgency that they normally would, that it ultimately cost them because that was a huge freaking play. It was a huge play. <laughs> He's Lewis Reddick, the ESPN Monday Night Football Analyst. Of the four losing teams over this weekend, who's in the best shape moving forward? Wow. You know, Really, I mean, I, I would say, look, the the Browns are. I, I think the Browns are in good shape because Kevin really does have a good idea of what he wants his football team to look like, and for the first time in a long time, he's got them pointed in the right direction. And Andrew Barry has done a fantastic job of continuing some of the work that they have done previously, as far as stockpiling draft picks and drafting young players. So I think they're in good shape from an AFC standpoint, and and look, I think Baltimore is too. On the on the NFC side, I think the Rams, the Rams got to figure out exactly what it is that that they really feel towards Jared Goff, and if he is going to be the guy for the future for them moving forward. And because it just sounds like Sean at this point in time is just non-committal, and that he's really going to take a deep dive, hard look at his football team, particularly at that position. But from from a young player standpoint, they have done a pretty darn good job under some difficult circumstances, given what they've given up in terms of draft capital to get some of the players that they have, of still stockpiling that roster and positioning themselves for the future here in, in one of the toughest divisions in football, if not the toughest division in football, ultimately out there in the NFC West. So I think those two teams in, in particular look real good going forward. I mean, the Saints have a lot of, a lot of issues going. I mean, they, they are just in absolute cap hell going forward. They got to figure out what's going on at quarterback now because you you have to assume that Drew's last game was last night. Is Jameis the guy? Is Taysom the guy? What's the situation there, and how are they going to continue to build out this roster given the fact that they're going to have such limited resources from the salary cap uh, salary cap room perspective? Would you rather go against Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady? <laughs> There's no uh, third option there, by the way. Yeah, you know what? I mean, I, I think, I mean, that, that's so, man. Either way, man, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be disrespecting two of the greats. But I think right now, I mean, I'd, I'd rather go against Tom because of the fact that I, I think like, Tom has his own reasons for wanting to continue to be great and obviously get to the Super Bowl. And the guy has never become complacent, despite the fact that he's been the most successful individual probably in team sports maybe in the in well definitely in the history of the nfl but aaron aaron's just on a different he's on a different level and has a mindset in a in a cockiness in a in kind of a, a way about him right now that having talked to them both this year on, on, on monday night uh production calls 
that you just knew that he was going to continue to try and just absolutely torch everyone all year long. And he, he, was, he was in a zone with, with Matt LaFleur that maybe he's never, ever been in in his entire career. And that's saying something given some of the spectacular seasons that, he, that he's had. But can we simplify come- this, Low Lewis, and say when the Packers drafted Jordan Love, they lit a fire in Aaron Rodgers? Um, well, we can try to, although if you, if you ask him and when you talk to him, he won't say it lit a fire, although you, you know it did to some degree. I mean, because you, you know them, he's just one of the he's, – he's a type A competitor. I, I just think he hit a, a level in his second year – so in the off season, in terms of his relationship with Matt, that this, this was inevitable, whether or not they drafted Jordan or not. I think this, this, the evolution in terms of his comfort in that offense was going to happen, Dan, no matter what. I would draft they, they a really, quarterback in this year's draft. Too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, it, there, there's no doubt that you know, look, he, he's he's again given all, no matter how successful he has been, and that's the cool thing about all these guys, all these guys who are supreme, supreme achievers. They, I mean, just like the Jordan, like like we saw with Jordan in the Last Dance, they always are looking for something. And even though they won't admit it, of course it drives them. But I think that relationship, and I'm a big look, I'm big on that part of it, on the importance of relationships. As he developed that relationship with Matt Lafleur in the offseason, and Matt talked about that too. This thing just took off, man. I mean, it just took off, and you see, you see it happening with Tom right now. As him and Bruce get more comfortable, as him and Byron get more comfortable in Tampa Bay, they look like they are starting to click. And they really did last night. Now, is it going to be enough against Green Bay? I mean, you know, you've been up there. You know how miserable it is up there. And Aaron has talked about it. How much are you willing to suffer when you come to Lambeau? How much are you, How much can you take? How, how soon until you start looking at the clock going, hey, those buses right outside the stadium, heat them up, man. I'm going to get the hell out of here. That's what he says. It's, just, it's, it's how long are you willing to suffer? And we'll, we're going to find out next week as far as Tampa's concerned. Uh, let's see. What else did I have? Oh, how do you salvage Deshaun Watson? <laughs> you know, I was just asked this a little while ago. I, I don't know. I mean, you, you know how relationships are. Sometimes it's not salvageable. Sometimes you just breach someone's trust so, so much to the point where there is no turning back. There just isn't. And this sounds so systemic down there and so ingrained in the way not only he feels, but other players feel too, that I don't know if you do. I, I, don't, I just don't know if you, if you do. And that would be a damn shame, to be honest with you. But you start because taking it, offers, it, it, though, Lewis? What's that? You start taking offers? I think you have to listen. Because if the guy doesn't want to play and, you, and he has a no-trade clause and you can't dictate to him where you send him to, I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, what, what are you going to do? And they're, they're in a terrible situation from a team rebuild as far as not having draft capital. And they could get a boatload of it. And there's teams out there who have a boatload of it to offer them. Now, that would be a terrible way to start off your, your, you know, your tenure down there if you're Nick Casario. But, hey, if you're Nick, you're, you're like, hey, look, I'm not the one who created this situation. I'm, I'm not the one who directly created this situation, but I'm going to try and make the best of it because it may be one of those then that you can't recover. And if you listen to Deshaun and you talk to people who have been down there, and it's not just Deshaun who's feeling this way. He's just the front-facing guy. He's just the one. God forbid, I'll tell you what, if J.J. Watt comes out and says something like this too to the point where he says, look, I just want out of here. I want to end my time here because the wheels are going to really come off. Well, he's going to. And, that, and that's I, too bad. I, yeah, he's not going to play there next year. I can't see no. J.J. playing there. Uh, and also, I, w- I was told this two weeks ago by a source. Don't be surprised if Eric Bieniemy does not get a head coaching job. Now there's two openings, Lewis. What am I missing here with Eric Bieniemy? And it looks like Leslie Frazier might be the leading candidate with Houston. And then we have Philadelphia. I think what you have is, look, is, Human beings are making these decisions, and human beings engage in confirmation bias all the, all the time. And right now, for some reason, and I, I don't really want to go down this rabbit hole to the point where you know we, we make this into a racial discussion, but for some reason, all these things, all these different excuses keep coming up about Eric, whether it be he doesn't interview well or are there things in his past that cause you to press pause you know, in, in terms of his accountability and leadership and 
and, and, you know, his dependability going forward, which are just BS. And Andy has talked about so many different times that it's just ridiculous to even bring up at this point. But I think that that's what's happening. Then, of course, there's the whole he doesn't call plays. Well, you know what? I, I've talked to Andy enough times about this in Brett Beach to say that look, the amount of responsibility that they put on him is is the same, if not more, than the responsibility that Andy gave to both Doug and um, and Matt Nagy. So I, I don't. I, I would I would hope like hell that this is not simply about you know the whole you know, being comfortable with hiring people who don't necessarily look like you have the same experiences as you and you still have those kind of hangups and have those kind of reservations that would keep you from hiring a young coach like him, a relatively young coach like him, who has coached one of the greatest players we've seen come into this league ever and who vouches for him without, without pause. I would hate that that would – I would hope that that is not something that is deciding this, uh, this man's future as far as being a head coach. But I'm not naive enough to think that it's not a factor because there's no other reason. There's no other reason at this point, Dan. There's just flat out no other reason. And, and that's, that's awful. That's something I know the commissioner does not want to be the case. I've talked to the commissioner. I know how important that is to him. And for this to be something that, again, we're addressing another, another year, another hiring cycle, is just flat-out embarrassing and ridiculous that we're having to even entertain these conversations. Why isn't Eric Bieniemy at the forefront of someone's, you know, of, of someone's um, hiring wish list? Why is he not at, not at the top? I'd love to know what those reasons are, those objective reasons are. I would love to have sat in on an interview with him and tell, and to where people come out of an interview and go, nah, he's not quite the guy. And that's not to take anything away from some of these other guys who are getting jobs, because I tell you this, I said back in September, the very first time I talked to Brandon Staley, this kid is fantastic. He's fantastic. Was blown away by him. And Sean told me that at the Super Bowl last year, you're going to be blown away by Brandon Staley. He is that sharp. I've talked to Robert Sala. I know how, how impressive he is. I know how impressive he is. Brian Dable, I know how impressive, you know, even though he may not get his job either in this cycle. I know how impressive these guys are. Arthur Smith, I've known for 15 years. Arthur Smith used to come and watch tape with me in Washington, sitting in the, in the scouting room, in the scouting hallway, when he was just trying to figure out what he wanted to do with his life. And, and, and Vinny Serrato and his dad, Fred Smith, said, hey, can he just sit in here and watch film with you? He just wants to be around football. And now he, I knew Arthur was going to be a head coach. So these guys are fantastic. But for Eric right now to have the conversation swirling around him in the manner in which it is, is just criminal. It, it really is. It, it's, it's sad because I've talked to him as well and probably talked to more people about him than I've talked to about any of these guys. And it's just, it's just so unfortunate and it's so defeating and it's so deflating. But onward we must press. And that's just the way it is. Well said, Lewis. Thank you. We appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely, Dan. Thank That's, you. That's uh, Lewis Riddick from the Mothership Monday Night Football Analyst.